So every year, y'all know I like to give a, a 30,000 foot overview, kind of talk about the crop. Uh, this year wasn't a whole lot of positive here lately, I guess, in terms of the, the damage and stuff that we've had, but we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. As far as acres go, we're, we're still projected at 2.2 million. Uh, for our total harvest, we are still harvesting. I talked to some guys this morning running combines. I know y'all know plenty of people that still have a few in the field. As of our November estimates, though, we're still predicted to cut 53 bushels per acre. Uh, if that is our number that we get to, that will tie the previous yield record, which was set last year, uh, 53 bushels. Uh, you know, and in all honesty, I wouldn't be surprised if that number was a little bit higher. Uh, really, really good yield crop in a lot of places this year. Of course, the environmental challenges and the damage and those things are the things that have kind of kind of set us back in a, in a lot of cases. I think every year we talk about the environmental challenges we have at planting time. It's either too hot or too cold, too wet or too dry. Uh, we, we always have issues there, but this has been you know, the first time in, in several years where we've had the, the challenges that we've had in, in the harvest time of the year. And I know seed quality is a big topic of conversation. I talk about it often. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later in the, in the presentation. So as far as the planting progress, and I, and I show this to kind of tie into the seed quality thing, Tom uh, Allen made the point yesterday. Uh, if y'all remember last year, we had a really favorable April. We got a lot of our beans planted in April in that early window. Uh, had a, a lot of good success getting a stand. You know, 2018, you, the blue line that you see there, that's, that's 2018's planting progress, and the orange line is the five-year average. We were pretty average this year. Uh, not a lot of not a lot of acres got planted in April, and a lot of that that did get planted in April got replanted. Uh, depending on where you were, it might have got replanted three times. Uh, we planted a lot of acres in May, a lot of acres, real fast in May, and I think those are the ones that we've had uh, a lot of damage issues. We had a lot of beans get ready real close together and, and had a hard time getting them out with the rains that we kept getting and the challenges that were associated with with the harvest. So I'm going to do kind of like I always do. I'm going to skip around a couple different topics with you. I'm going to start with kind of what we faced as a challenge earlier this year, uh, getting, a, getting a solid stand, replant decisions. Uh, you know, that was a common phone call and picture that I received most of the planting season. I talked about replants with people in April, uh, May, June. Uh, guys up in extreme northeast Mississippi were replanting beans in, in July. Uh, just a real tough time getting getting an adequate stand. Uh, I've showed this data in the past, and, and I want to show it again because I think it's so so relevant to what we experience every year in, in trying to get a crop in the ground when we can't predict the weather, uh, and I kind of had to handle it whenever we we get these suboptimum stands in the field. So Mr. Shane Carver, who uh, is in the audience today, graduated in May. Uh, this was his thesis project when he was here as a, as a master's graduate student. Uh, so, you know, kind of the goal of this was to, to see what would happen if we had fairly uniform, thin populations in the field. How would we handle those populations? Is it better to tear them up, start over? Do we plant into those stands, kind of thicken them up? Do we leave them alone? What do we do? Uh, I don't know how well those pictures show up in, in, on the, the slide for you, but our treatments were basically removals. We blended seed, we blended Liberty Lincoln Roundup Ready uh, Extend seed so that we could overspray and, and just thin out. So when we planted these things, of course the seed fell at random. And after we overspray with that herbicide, we were left with what simulated a, a pretty, to, to a pretty good degree of what you would see if you got a fairly uniform but thin stand come up in the field. So say it just pounding rain after after you planted and you just things came up, it was just thin. That's what we were after. We were trying to simulate, you know, a real world scenario. So we had these different removal rates. We we blended the seed in these these specific numbers where we could know what we were removing from the population. Uh, our target zero percent removal would have been 130,000 planting rate, initial planting rate. And then from there, we removed 25, 50, 75, and 100 percent of that. So what we did after that was we would come in and we would replant into that, or we would leave it alone. Okay. So we would we would replant. You know, if we removed 25, we would either come back in and plant 25, 50, 75, or 100. So we had all these different combinations of total populations in the field, and we managed those all the way out to harvest and and uh, and took yield. So the yield is what I'll show and. Uh, Shane will laugh at this because this was always a hard graph to, to explain. So don't get lost in this. A lot of columns, 
uh, you know, the thing I want you to focus on would be on the far uh, left here. So this 0% column, that would be your standard, that would be achieving the perfect stand the first attempt, and everything that we measure would have been compared back to that. So we have all these different removals, so uh, you see the removal across the top, 0, 25, 50, 75, and 100 percent across the bottom, each of those bars would be how much we added back to this population. And remember those 130,000 was our target. Okay, so bottom line is, is when you go over to the far right and you see that 100 percent removal and 100 percent replant, that would simulate tearing that crop completely up, spraying it with gramoxone, starting over with a full stand. So we see a yield reduction there between that compared to our initial stand. That's likely just a, a planting date uh, situation. So, you know, two, two and a half, three weeks go by from the time you plant the first time, realize that you're not gonna get a stand, have to go out there and spray it, replant it. And, and so naturally, you know, we have enough planting date data to know that as time goes by, we're losing yield. So that, that comes from the planting date component. The thing that was interesting to me was, was that, you know, we get out there and we, we plant 130 or 140, we get 100 up, 90 up, it looks kind of thin, we want to go back out there sometimes and add some to it. Uh, you know, what is that bringing to the table? Uh, when, whenever we did that, we didn't see a yield difference. We were better off just not spending the extra money on adding seed to uh, a thin stand. So the bottom line, and, and we saw this in quite a few places this year, and I, and I followed up with a couple of guys that uh, where we made the decision to keep some of these populations as low as in the uh, neighborhood of 60,000 plants per acre. Had a good stand, solid, uniform 60,000 plants per acre. We made a decision to keep some of these instead of tearing them up. Uh, the date was getting late and it's just hard to make the decision to tear up a, a good planting date to start over with a better stand that you might or might not get uh, when you have a later planting date. So, uh, you know, the bottom line is when, when we're in that 60 to 70,000 range, we have a healthy stand. Uh, depending on what that planting date is, that decision is likely going to be best to, to leave that stand alone and move forward with it. Now, of course, this is a planting date deal. If we're having this conversation the first week of April uh, on some beans that we planted May the 16th, or March the 16th, excuse me, obviously we're still in a good window of planting date and, and it may be worth tearing that stand up and, and coming to have a full stand to carry you out for the rest of the season. But if we're like we are in most cases and we're talking about an April the 20th planted bean uh, versus replanting it May the 15th or May the 20th, I would argue that we, we should do everything we can to keep that optimum planting date and move forward with that. So shift gears just a little bit. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about fungicide timing, uh, seed quality. Uh, so this is Mr. Chase Floyd. He is finishing up his master's degree project and, and one thing that he did was reevaluate some of these fungicides looking at, at different timings and as a result of the environment that we had this year we were able to keep some seed samples and we had those graded for seed quality to see if we could find any uh, differences across these, these products that we applied at these timings. So the bottom line is this, this project kind of got generated just, you know, we get that question from time to time, hey, I missed that R3 timing, we're closer to R5, is there still a benefit uh, to making this automatic application? You know, where's that cutoff to uh, re receiving that yield benefit from an automatic application? So that was the, the basis behind that. I won't go into all these details. I do just want to point out that from a varietal standpoint, we did plant varieties that had really good disease packages. You know, we weren't targeting uh, trying to find, uh, you know, a benefit from the fungicide in terms of disease presence. So we were trying to plant really good disease package varieties and then measure that yield enhancement that, that would occur following the fungicide application from an automatic standpoint. So we had five application timings. We made a, 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 a application R3, R4, R5, R6, and then we had a two pass uh, of R3 followed by another shot at R5 using three different products. So we had a standalone Quadris, a Quadris Top SBX, and then a Preaxor and Domark treatment. So here are the data for the timing. And what we have found through this that there is no difference in yield response by timing. So we saw the, the same uh, benefit from a, from a fungicide application regardless of the timing that it was made. Uh, you know, I think that over the last few years we've kind of migrated to delaying after R3, maybe targeting more R4, and I think that's the, the right move, especially when these data uh, confirm that 
uh, kind of delaying that application, give us a little more protection as we move later into the growing season. So when we look at it the other way, we, we, we did have a difference between products, and this is no surprise. I mean, we've, we've talked about this for a few years. Uh, you know, Preaxor and Domark and then Quadris Top both separated away from that untreated, and a standalone Quadris application did not. It was the uh, same yield as an untreated check. I think the thing here to point out, and Tom mentioned this yesterday, now keep in mind what I just said about the varieties. These varieties had really good disease packages. Uh, we did see a statistical separation, so we did have a difference in, in yield, but it was just over two bushels. So one thing that we have to keep in mind is the varieties that we're planting, uh, the fungicides that we're going to apply, what the soybean price is at the, at the market at the time, a lot of things go into the equation as to uh, how to make these decisions moving forward for an automatic standpoint. Damage results. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. Uh, you can see these bars are all over the board. And the bottom line is, is that, you know, this is one, one year, three locations within one year. Uh, and and this, is, this is total damage to the sample. So you see the range from 10.5 to 17% damage. Uh, some, of, some of the locations were worse than others, so this is averaged across those locations. So, you know, it's really hard to draw a conclusion from this. The bottom line is if there are differences from making a fungicide application for seed quality is very subtle, and I don't think that those things, based on the data we have right now, would, would shake out from an economic standpoint. So shifting gears one last time, uh, kind of talking about moving forward for this year. Uh, you know, my first thoughts in the market we're at is what can we do to maximize our economic return? And of course, you know, every year, I'm going to I'm going to talk about this everywhere I go. It's just it's just something that I, I can't ever get over. But planting date. So this particular graph is a is a irrigation and planting date study. But the the trend of the the yield responses based on the maturity groups and the planting date would mimic uh, most data sets that we could dig up and find. This is one that that. Uh, Dr. Wilkes Wood and Dr. Jason Cruz conducted a couple years ago. So the, the purpose of their, their study was to evaluate, you know, irrigation efficiency across these different maturity groups and planting dates. Uh, what I want to use this to talk about today is the maturity groups and the planting dates. And again, early planting, that's April. Uh, our data suggests April the 20th we begin to lose a uh, yield by the day. Uh, so early would be defined as April, mid would be May, and, and then late would be June and beyond. And clearly we see the maturity group four varieties in that early plant, uh, planted window is where we need to be whenever Mother Nature allows us to, to do that planting. So variety selection, I think that, that planting date and variety selection to me are the two things that will allow us to, to set our yield potential up uh, to be maximized from the front end for sure. I don't think that there could be two more important decisions that we could make through a growing season other than trying to select the right variety and, and planting it in an optimum window. So y'all know we do a lot of variety work. Uh, we have our, our MAFIS variety testing program, had over 200 varieties in it this year. Uh, we do a lot of uh, demo work from an extension standpoint, large plot stuff that we do statewide. Uh, we had uh, 26 or seven locations, I think, this year across the state. So this is our group four set from our own farm. Uh, work and, and not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about the differences here. Keep in mind that the varieties that we get to take to the on-farm thing are usually the elite uh, yielding varieties. So we'll, we'll take, this year we had 17 different varieties in this set, okay? So we'll measure things like lodging and, and green stem and, and yield, of course, but uh, back on the topic of seed quality, I know that's what's on everybody's mind. We did measure seed quality and, and I'll show you that here in just a minute. This is lodging uh, across all these group four varieties. There's, there's clearly some differences in lodging. Green stem, that's a, a big one. And, and as we see such turnaround in genetics so fast, oftentimes it's hard to capture that. But y'all know how, how difficult green stem can be whenever we get to the end of the year and you're trying to get that machine to run through it. And uh, so I think that's something worthy to, to, to keep into consideration. But from our standpoint, nothing that we evaluated this year had any major issues in green stem, nothing that would have kept the combine from, from being able to get through it too difficult. Yield, uh, a lot of good yielders. Uh, you know, uh, all this information is published outside. This is the one I want to get to, seed damage. So 
This is averaged across different locations and you see some, some numerical separation there between some of the varieties. The one thing that, that I guess that I paid attention to this year and looking at all this, it depends on where you're standing. You know, you could take these varieties in Sunflower County, for example, and we may see a clear difference in seed quality per variety. So it really just depends on where you are. Uh, when we look at our overall data set, there weren't any differences in damage. Uh, but when we look at it, depending on where you are in that environment, so that just goes to remind us how important environment is in terms of this seed quality. There are uh, some differences, some subtle differences between the genetics. We have some other data that we've, we've looked at. My point is, is that this is something that, that we feel pretty strong about capturing. So moving forward, uh, we're going to try to find a way for sure in the demo sets, it's a little easier to do when you're talking about 17 to 20 varieties. For sure, we're gonna capture this year in, year out. We may not have damage for five years, who knows? I hope we don't. But if we do, we're gonna capture that information and, and publish it so we can keep uh, track of the genetic potential and, and how that relates to uh, seed quality. The OVT program, we had a meeting last week, we intend to do the same thing in it. It's gonna be a little bit more challenging with a couple hundred varieties. Uh, to figure out how to do that. But that is something that's on our radar, so please please know that. I know there's a lot of frustration out there uh, in terms of, of the damage and the issues that we've had this year. Variety uh, selection for iron corrosis, we've screened those again this year. We had 98 varieties that we screened for iron corrosis tolerance, so any of you guys that have to fight that issue, please, please pick up that publication as well. All this information that I'm talking about from a variety standpoint is out here on the table, so if you hadn't picked it up, please swing by there and grab that. Uh, lots of online tools to, to help us in these variety selection decisions. All right, thanks again, and if not, you know, obviously we'll be around, so y'all please let us know if we can do anything. Thank you.